This is Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles. This week, Jonathan Bennett and I talk with Hector Martin about Asahi Linux, which runs on M1 hardware, specifically Mac hardware that now runs on M1. The M1 is, I, I, I learned so much about the M1 that I had no idea about and about how Linux can run on it and all the stuff Apple's doing and how it all works together. Um, it's huge. And uh, Jonathan and I go really in depth with this thing. Hector is an awesome guest, and that is coming up next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 680, recorded Wednesday, May 11th, 2022. Asahi Linux on M1 Hardware. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Compiler, an original podcast from Red Hat, discussing tech topics, big, small, and strange. Listen to Compiler on Apple Podcasts or anywhere you listen to podcasts. And by New Relic. That next 9 p.m. call is just waiting to happen. Get New Relic before it does, and you can get access to the whole New Relic platform at 100 gigabytes of data free per month forever. No credit card required. Sign up at newrelic.com slash floss. And by Collide. Get endpoint management that puts the user first. Visit collide.com slash floss. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash floss to learn more and to activate a free 14-day trial today. No credit card required. Hello again, everybody, everywhere, every time. The time is right always <laughs> for you. This is Doc Searles here, and this is Floss Weekly. Joined this week... Again, two straight weeks <laughs> by Jonathan Bennett. <laughs> hey, and there, there he is, for those of you who are not visually impaired. <laughs> it, and, it just worked out that way. Uh, you know, this week, <laughs> I, I kind of claimed this week months ago because it's it's Asahi Linux, something I'm really interested in. And last week, there was a quick scramble of, oh, no, who's going to co-host? And as usual, I was the one that was flexible and on top of it. You so. are... You are primary. Uh, you're the you're the lead off the bench. Except we don't have a bench. We just we have, a, we have rotating starters. Uh, but you you you're, you're there. You're usually there. You're also also in the back channel usually too, which is uh, extremely helpful. We a lot of our good questions we get come from you. So yeah, so you're it, you're really familiar with this. You jumped on this. So it, 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 brief us a little bit before we get into it about where it's coming from for you. Okay, sure. Um, so Hector Martinez is the guest, and he is the, I believe, the lead developer behind something called Asahi Linux, which is porting Linux to the new Apple M1 chip, which is just a, a mind-boggling achievement that they've been able to make so much progress so quickly. I think it's, has it been out a year? Something around a year that the, the yeah, M1 chip has been out in, in people's hands? And they've got a, a fully working, well, I say fully, a usable Linux desktop on it now. And I believe <laughs> they just made a, a beta release of it. Uh, it. It's extremely impressive, the amount of work that they've done so quickly. And then, and then Hector and I seem to also share a couple of other interests, like uh, well, kernel development in general, but uh, also... I, I've gone back and forth with him over Pipewire, the, the Linux audio toolkit, and using that with FireWire devices. And it's just kind of a, an extremely niche thing. It seems like there's only five of us out there in the entire world that want to do that. But Hector and I seem to be two of the people that are real interested in it. So it, it's it's fun. Well, that's interesting because I, I I have a drawer in the other room there full of old FireWire devices. <laughs> and, uh, and Apple doesn't really support it anymore, I don't think, maybe even on their old stuff. Um, I just consider the boat anchors at this point. But that would be, there's a lot of stuff on there I probably would want to get at. So that's an interesting thought. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, well, I want to get into it because we, we have a lot to talk about this morning. But first, I have to let everybody know that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Compiler, an original podcast from Red Hat uh, discussing tech topics, big, small, and strange. Compiler comes to you from the makers of Command Line Heroes, another of our sponsors, and is hosted by Angela Andrews and Brent Simino. Technology can be big, bold, bizarre, and complicated. Compiler unravels industry topics, trends, and the things you've always wanted to know about tech through interviews with the people who know it best. On their show, you'll hear a chorus of perspectives from the diverse communities behind the code. 
Compiler brings together a curious team of red hatters to tackle big questions in tech like, what is technical debt? What are the tech hiring managers actually looking for? And do you have to know how to code to get started with open source? Episode 2 covers what can video games teach us about edge computing. The internet is a patchwork of international agreements and varying infrastructure, but there's something coming to change the ways we connect. In this episode of Compiler, hosts explore what edge computing could mean for people who enjoy video games and what this form of entertainment could teach us about the technology. Episode 9 is How Are Tech Hubs Changing? Traditionally, if someone wanted a career in tech, they had to make the move to a tech hub, a city packed with startups and talent. But things are starting to change. The hosts of Compiler speak to a few of the change makers who are thinking outside the physical and social dimensions we've come to associate with innovation. An interesting one to me about that is that my last company started in North Carolina, which we wanted to make a head tech hub. It wasn't, and we moved to Silicon Valley. And then Red Hat came into North Carolina and made it much more of a tech hub. And now here's Red Hat talking about how we can go out to the edges wherever the edges are. You can learn more about all of that, on, about Compiler in general, at red.ht slash twit. New episodes are out now. Go and download them at any time and be sure to check back for new shows. Listen to Compiler on Apple Podcasts or anywhere you listen to podcasts. We'll also include a link on this episode's show page. My thanks to Compiler for their support. Okay, so our guest this morning is... Uh, is uh, <laughs> I was going to attempt the Spanish pronunciation, but it's uh, <laughs> I'm not, not proficient in that. But it, it's it's Hector Martin, I think, in, in Spanish, but... Uh, Hector Martin to most people. So welcome to the show, Hector. Thank you for having me. Yeah, this is great. <laughs> and uh, and Jonathan's all over this. But but I'm going to get started because I've been, um, I it, it's interesting to me that, I mean, Apple has come out with the M1 chip. It's a, it's a very verticalized chip. They made it for themselves. Yep. It gets more and more massive all the time. They now have the Ultra, which are two <laughs> of their top ones pushed together. There are what a trillion transistors or something like that in there. A lot of it is dedicated to their stuff alone. Um, the idea of an off-the-shelf x86 six derived chip is kind of in the past, except for other platforms. That's where Linux has lived for the duration. So what, what makes you want to climb that mountain? And what do you see at the top of it if you ever get there? Uh, well, you know, I mean, when Apple came up with these things, it's... It was actually quite impressive, right? Like I've I've never been an Apple user. I've never owned uh, like a MacBook. I've been using an iMac uh, for like the half year before us. I started only because a friend was getting rid of it and was like, "Well, yeah, sure, it was a minor upgrade and useful." And I wanted a 4K screen. Um, but um, you know, like uh, I'm not an Apple um, ecosystem person because um, I never really saw the value, you know, in proposition in MacBooks. Like they're like they're nice machines, but it's you know it's another x86 machine. Um, but then Apple came up with the M1 and it's like, wait, this is actually kind of special, right? Like, um, uh, there is a big difference here in efficiency and power consumption and just how the machines run. And, and I've been wanting, I've actually been wanting an ARM based, um, you know, like desktop type machine for a long time. And it, it's, you know, many years ago, I thought, you know, maybe someday we'll get ARM machines and, and, you know, Apple came up with, uh, with this and, um, it's it's not my first rodeo doing Linux ports to strange machines. You know, it's kind of a thing that I do, um, and so I thought, you know, why not? Let's let's make this a thing. Let's make this a project. Hey, I I want to I want to jump in and ask: Have you guys gotten any well any support or any pushback from Apple as part of this project? Uh, and, and then dovetailed in with that, there is a rumor that there is actually already a Linux port to the M1 that lives only inside the bowels of the Apple headquarters. And I'm curious if there's any truth to that that you know of. Um, we haven't gotten any pushback and we've gotten sort of what I believe is support in the sense of, I think there's at least one engineer at Apple that likes us. Um, because <laughs> I can tell the story. There's a very specific thing, right? So we have this boot. By the way, Apple supports, as in allows, as in this is designed to the system, third-party mm -hmm. OSs on these machines. So there's no hacking. There's no weird, you know, like bypassing security or anything like that. 
it, the, putting Linux on these machines that's officially supported, it, it's just Apple will not help you with it. Um, so that's one thing. But uh, the interesting thing is that um, when we started working on this, uh, we, there's like, you know, there's like the, the boundary between Apple stuff and our stuff, right? And that boundary changed incompatibly in a few macOS versions ago. And on the same release, they added a feature to the command that lets you load like the next boot stage that allows you to load it as a raw image instead of as their own like executable format. And I cannot for the life of me come up with a reason for them to do that other than to make our lives easier because they have no use for that whatsoever. <laughs> so you're, I think that was angel. like someone at Apple liked us yes. and added us so this wouldn't happen again because they broke like that broke support for our binaries was a, due to, you know, some silly, uh, you know, change in the ABI. And it's like at the same time they added that. It's like well, it's not going to break ever again because it's a lot simpler. <laughs> 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 yeah and how about that rumored linux port that may or may not already exist have you heard anything about uh, that it, uh, yeah no it, it definitely does because there's at least like one comment in in like mac os mac os uh, the kernel is open source by the way the very core um mm -hmm. it's not very useful because most of the drivers aren't <laughs> but you know the core is and there are comments in there that imply that they use Linux as a silicon validation platform which is huh. completely like standard like lots of vendors do that um, because Linux is easy to port and easy to hack around. Um, mm -hmm. But the thing is, like, this, this, the rumor is that, you know, like, there's this Linux port at Apple. I guarantee you this Linux port is like, you know, this hacked together kernel fork, you know, 20 <laughs> versions ago that just barely runs and brings up some peripherals and just tests that, like, the CPU is sane. It's not like they have, you know, like a Linux desktop at Apple HQ. <laughs> it's I mean, it's a just, hack that their engineers use to test things. You just described every Linux SDK that every vendor has ever shipped. Sad I know, and that's sad. <laughs> so Linux already supports ARM. What? How much was that helpful to get started with the M1? Like how much ground did, did you already automatically have gained? And then what's the process for, for trying to get further into this? Um, you know, how do you, how do you get from point A to point B? Um, well, I mean... Linux supporting ARM is very important because that gets rid of, you know, all the user space issues and like 90% of the like core kernel importing stuff. Um, so like the, we did release an alpha uh, a couple months ago and that the user space is unmodified Arch Linux ARM. Like it literally pulls from the repositories. Uh, we just have another repo on top with a few things that we add. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, like it's, it's ARM. So ARM software will run um with a few like there's a few tiny caveats but basically arm software will run the kernel the arm port to the kernel basically runs um but then nothing else is basically useful <laughs> um so all the drivers all the hardware is different and even the way they integrate into the arm architecture is technically standard like it's standard as far as the cp architecture and just about nothing else so we had to make core changes to linux's arm support not many but we had to make some to make this all work out yeah. So what, what's the uh, what's the state of it now? Like what percentage, what what bits work on the uh, Apple laptops and, and what things are still in progress? Um, so the state is basically that we have enough core drivers for, you know, a subset of people to daily drive this. Um, so it will run on the laptop. It runs on all the machines except the M1 Ultra. Well, that it does run. It's just not pushed yet. Basically, we'll be releasing <laughs> that pretty soon. Um, but, uh, the, like, basically like you can boot a desktop, you get a frame buffer, but the CPU is fast enough that you can actually like run a composite <laughs> KDE desktop and it's not bad depending on your screen resolution. Um, you, you know, like software speaking, basically works. Um, speaking of and, things being hacked together. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it, you gotta start somewhere. Um, yes. so the, um, like, you know, you get USB two, um, you, the on the laptops the battery uh, information works um you can turn on the backlight on and off at least um the audio so the audio the headphone jack works on the m1 systems not pro and max because that uses a different codec uh the speakers work but we disable them because we want to make sure people don't blow them up until we have a stack that we are like confident in um but the drivers are there um like battery charging works um we don't have uh, wi-fi works uh, we don't have Bluetooth. We don't have uh, Thunderbolt and USB 3.0, though that's coming pretty soon. Um, 
And uh, there's no like acceleration for anything, no video decode or no GPU. So like none of the you know engines work. Um, but the CPUs work. CPU frequency works. Uh, frequency scaling. Um, and we don't have sleep mode yet, uh, nor CPU sleep states. But it turns out that these machines are efficient enough that even without any of that, you get like eight to ten hours of idle runtime on one of the laptops. Oh, that's impressive. Um, let's see. There's a, there's several directions I want to go here. Um, there's there's some work being done on uh, actually supporting the GPU side of the M1. Uh, yes. I believe uh, Alyssa Rosenweg has been doing a lot of work yes. on trying to get that tuned up for Mesa. Uh, where where's that at? I, I think I think some OpenGL calls are actually working now, if I remember correctly. Oh, uh, we're at uh, like ninety over ninety five percent GLES two compliance already. Um, oh wow! You, so that's much the, further along. Yeah, but that's the thing is the GPU is two things, right? There's a user space driver and the kernel space driver. And mm -hmm. so right now on Linux, there's nothing because the kernel space driver isn't ready because we're reverse engineering that. So what Alyssa <laughs> did is from the very beginning, like while we were working on all these drivers and kernel, and a lot of last year was spent writing tooling, by the way. I can I can talk about that mm -hmm. if you want. But um, but basically, you know, from the very beginning, before we didn't even have a kernel running on these machines, practically, um, she started working on macOS because she said, OK, macOS has a kernel driver. I'm going to make Mesa run on that. And she started reverse engineering the user space side of the GPU to write a you know user space Mesa driver that um, can do all the, you know, actual 3D API implementation when combining the shaders and all that stuff. And meanwhile, we were working on all the other stuff, right? Because there's a lot of things that have to be done before the GPU makes even sense on the kernel side. Mm -hmm. So we're at this sort of, you know, like unbalanced state right now where the user space GPU site is getting really good um, and the kernel <laughs> site is getting started now. But that does mean <laughs> that because the kernel site is a lot less long tailish in, ta in terms of mm -hmm. work, right? Like once it works, you get most of it because the long tail is the user space side and the like, you know, higher GL version support and all that. Um, that means that, you know, we're going to go from nothing on Linux to accelerated desktop in probably a few weeks once the kernel driver gets to that point, uh, because all the user space work will just plug in on top of that. It's probably fair to say, based on some of the crazy things that Apple is doing with their user space, that once this works, you'll have better acceleration than Apple does as far as supporting things like Vulkan and OpenGL, right? Um, well, Vulkan has not started yet. The thing is that um, to support uh, APIs like Vulkan, you really need to understand the hardware well. And mm -hmm. so Alyssa started with uh, OpenGL ES2 and okay. OpenGL2, um, which is sort of, you know, the, the lowest common denominator. But you have to start simple, right, to make sense of the hardware. Um, so Vulkan will take more time because that has to be started, you know, um, at the sort of API level practically from scratch. And we want to make sure we understand, like, all the you know, little nuances of the GPU before we start doing that, because it's a lot harder to get Vulkan right than to get, like, you know, older DL right. But eventually, uh, yes, we should be able to support more of OpenGL than Apple does, simply because Apple hasn't actually been maintaining OpenGL in, like, you know, several years now. Right. Um, so, yeah. All right. Uh, so let, let's let's dive into that that tooling, because you guys did some really impressive and some clever things, from what I understand, to... Uh, to even get to this point, um, it seems like there was something like uh, you wrote a shim virtual machine to be able to intercept API calls. Lead us, lead us down that rabbit hole and tell us a little bit about how all of that yeah. works. Um, so this is something that I learned, you know, reverse engineer uh, over the years that uh, most people who get started with this sort of working on weirdo platforms, right, they get into this test cycle where it's like, uh, write it says program, compile it, copy it to an SD card and plug it into the machine and reboot it and try it and look at the serial port and then unplug it and plug it back in and then copy another, you know, and you end up spending like at least five minutes every test cycle. Um, and so one thing I learned is that you need to make your life as easy as possible if you're going to get anywhere, because you're not going to get anywhere with a five minute test cycle trying to figure out how hardware works. Um, so, um, you know, sort of my job um, has been writing a lot of tooling so that myself and others uh, can work efficiently on reverse engineering the platform. And um, well, there's a Gen 2 boot on it. <laughs> you know, I'm actually a Gen 2 user, but I haven't run Gen 2 on the M1s yet. I use Arch Linux on those. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the um, so the idea is that you you need to, you know, like every hour you spend on tooling is going to save you many more hours in the long run uh, on everything you're doing. Even if you want to get, you know, sort of you want to jump straight into it, it really pays off. So uh, the first thing I did is something that I always do with these weird platforms is that I want some kind of like interface over a serial port or something where I can remotely control this machine 
And instead of, uh, you know, having to reinstall code or whatever, uh, just load things dynamically and run things dynamically, right? And the way I do that is that um, we put a little shim on the machine that just listens for commands over a serial port originally or USB later. And then on a host, we run Python scripts that remotely puppeteer whatever the machine is doing. Uh, and so this means that we have, you know, this giant Python code base of experiments and drivers and things um, that is all just for research. Uh, but it's so, you know, convenient to have Python, right, to do all this work. Because you can, again, write tooling and write all kinds of scaffolding and things. And it's like, I want something to, you know, brute force every value of this register, see what it does. And it's, you know, it's so much easier than trying to write C um, when you don't know what you're doing yet, right? Because you're not, you don't know how the hardware works. <laughs> Um, and then you get a shell, you get an interactive shell, right? And so it turns this five minute test cycle for figuring out what one register does into a one second test cycle, which is just typing the command and press enter and it happens, right? Um, and even rebooting is like seven seconds. So, uh, so that was the first step, right? And that's good for experimenting with the hardware directly. Uh, so you can write like your own shim drivers and just, you know, kind of prove how everything works. Um, but the issue we have, of course, is that, um, you know, for some simple hardware, you can work out how it works by literally just brute forcing your way. Um, I did that for the intro controller because it's you know you can, it's so dumb that you can just dump the registers and guess what some of them do and try out the guesses and figure it out that way. That doesn't work most of the time though. Most things are not that easy. And and so what I wanted to do was the equivalent of what the Nouveau project did for NVIDIA GPUs. Um, and so what they do is they they have um, because it already provides a binary blob driver for Linux, um, mm -hmm. and so they have this patch. I don't know if it's a patch or a module for Linux um, that basically hooks everything that driver does. So it intercepts every access it makes to the hardware and dumps it. And so they will run the binary blob driver and log everything it's doing. And you know you can literally replay that log right and and have it do the same thing uh, for the most part. And um, and so then you know you look at the at that dump and you start guessing what things that do right and then you you do a different test on the Nvidia driver and then you see what changed in the dump and then you you sort of you know work your way around uh, by doing that over and over again and so I wanted to do the same thing on macOS um, I could have done it the same way with the kernel patch or module because macOS is open source um, but uh, I figured you know what um, I have a different idea. And what I ended up doing is I wrote a little hypervisor. I, I wouldn't call it a virtual machine because it's not, you know, it, it's not what most people think of as a virtual machine. Um, but it is a hypervisor that runs Mac OS as a guest OS on the machine and basically passes through all the hardware. The same way you would pass through a, you know, a GPU on, you know, QEMU and KVM with libvirt or whatever. Um, it does that for everything, including, you know, it's not like specific PCI devices, but like the entirety of the hardware on the chip with a few very specific exceptions, um, particularly the serial port we actually virtualize because we put that over a USB, which is extremely convenient. Uh, it's, you know, the, the debug serial port is suddenly just a USB device. You just, it's, it, you don't need any special <laughs> hardware. It's great. Um, but, um, but the main thing then is that what we can do is we can hook, you know, the hardware. We can say, intercept this and pass it through, but log what it's doing. Mm -hmm. And it's part of this whole Python uh, remote control thing. So we have, you know, the guest running on, on the VM on the machine and, and there's C code doing the low level of a hypervisor. But then anything interesting that happens, it breaks into Python, right? So we can say that like we've written a hypervisor half in Python, which is pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> That's usually not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, this is not what you usually write a VM for, right? Right, right, right. <laughs> That's why it's funny. Uh, yeah. It's almost like you've uh, you've built your own little uh, Wireshark for hypervisors. Yes, it's it's and, clever. And, I, and, I, yeah, and just like Wireshark has layers, right? So we have this uh -huh. whole stack, right? Where at the low level you're like intercepting individual memory reads and writes. Um, but then, you know, the hardware has a lot of layers, like there's co-processors here and there's like a remote procedural call protocol on that. And there's like endpoints on that and channels. And then there's another layer of messages. And then there's like bring buffers. And there's like, you know, and because especially things like the GPU and the display controller are are complicated. Right. And mm -hmm. so the, the Python has a lot of these layers and you just go in and, you know, you, you, you start building the code that um, dumps these layers and decodes them the same way Wireshark will show you different protocol layers on, um, 
on you know for a for a packet trace and and that's uh you know that's how you do it and it it is very complicated at the end but because you're working step by step right you you just you know inching your way forward until it makes sense right so i i'm curious <laughs> You know, we talk about I've, I've always told people when they ask about Macs that, you know, it's it's great hardware, but Apple are, always charges somewhere between five hundred and a thousand dollars more than what it's actually worth, which that's a very cynical viewpoint. But that's what I've told people. Does it does it actually make sense these days? Like, is it a reasonable thing for someone to do to say, hey, I want a Linux laptop. I know Asahi is great, so I'm going to go out and buy Mac hardware to run Linux on. Does that actually make sense or are we thinking more about being able to reuse these laptops. Uh, I'm just curious where kind of the value proposition lies for, for regular folks. I would buy them. Um, but the question is like how, um, you know, how much machine you want and what you want it for. Um, they're mm. low-end machines like the Mac Mini and the MacBook Air. I think they're actually like a pretty good value proposition. Uh, they're not that mm -hmm. expensive and you do get it, I mean, seriously, you have to try them. Like, because I've, I've had so many people say, like, I didn't believe the benchmark. I didn't believe the numbers. And then I tried one. And it's like, <laughs> holy sh No, really. Like, they stay cold, right? Like, you can be running Mac OS and doing, like, compiling. And, like, the fan, you can't even hear the fan. <laughs> and the battery lasts forever, right? Like, I leave one of these things lying around on Mac OS. And it's, like, a week in sleep mode, opening it randomly every, you know, every day and closing it. And it's still going. Um, it really is a huge difference compared to uh, x86 machines. And so that's why I said, you know, it's like I've never bought a Mac before because it didn't make sense. Well, if, mm. if you want that uh, performance per watt, if you want that battery life, suddenly it does make sense. And if you're willing to pay a premium to get the higher, that's the thing is, right? Apple does charge more for RAM and for SSD um, mm. that like, you know, Delta per, the, than pretty much, you know, the <laughs> most of the competition. And, um, and you can't upgrade it, um, which is a different story. But um, <laughs> so, yeah, like if, if, you know, if you have the money to splurge for a high end machine and you really want that performance and that, you know, power efficiency, that might make sense to you. Um, getting a high end, you know, getting a maxed out MacBook or a maxed out uh, Mac Studio probably doesn't make sense for most people. Uh, but at the same time, you know, if you want a to go machine that uh, performs well, has excellent battery life, is light. Um, it has things like Thunderbolt. Suddenly, you know, the M1 MacBook Air is something that I would actually recommend to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So there's a there's another device that Apple makes that they've put these M1s in, and that is some of their iPads. And I'm curious, is the, oh goodness, is the first really great usable Linux-based tablet going to be an Apple product? <laughs> If they open up the bootloader on those, which I freaking hope they do someday, but they probably won't. Uh, no, I would love to have a Sahi on an iPad because I've been wanting a machine for like, I, I guess you can probably see I do some music stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And that would be great for like, you know, sheet music and running like, you know, gig audio stuff and all that. And yep. um, but uh, unfortunately, the entire, you know, sort of open bootloader thing is something they put on the Macs. So there's an entire um framework on the on the bootloader that those machines have to make this possible that does not exist on ios devices that are on those ipads um so the only way asahi is going to run on those ipads is if apple changed their mind and like backport this into those machines or if someone finds you know a, a bootloader exploit that lets you run it anyway and even then that'll be kind of annoying because at that point, it won't be a Mac. So, like, there will be things to port to that um, in terms mm -hmm. of, like, the firmware. It will be a bit different from what they use on Macs and all that. Um, so, uh, and also then you end up in this cat and mouse game with Apple, right? Which is something that I'm very grateful for with this project <laughs> on the M1 Macs because it's we're not mm -hmm. fighting Apple, right? Um, and suddenly you have, you know, all, you can spend all your time writing Linux drivers instead of, like, you know, trying to figure out how to break their security because they fixed the previous thing, you know, the last thing that you were trying to use. Um, yes. So I'm very grateful that we don't have to deal with that. And all I can say is Apple, you know, it would be really nice if you port boot policy to uh, to the iPads. <laughs> <laughs> So I have I, I have been queuing up these questions while Jonathan has been pursuing his threads. And this is are all totally interesting. But first, I have to let people know that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by New Relic. If you're a software engineer, you've been there. It's 9 p.m. You're finally unwinding from work. Your phone buzzes with an alert. 
something's broken and your mind's already racing at what could be wrong. Is it the back end or the front end? Is it global? Is it the server? Is it the network? Is it the cloud provider? Uh, do we have slow running queries that I introduce a bug in my last deploy? Now the whole team's scrambling from tool to tool and messaging person after person to fix and find the issue. According to a new Relic report, only half of all organizations are implementing observability for their networks and systems. The report showed how maintaining network observability continues to be an issue for companies around the world. That won't happen if you get New Relic. New Relic combines 16 different monitoring products that you normally buy separately so engineering teams can see across their entire software stack in one place. You'll get application monitoring, that's APM, unified monitoring for your apps and microservices, Kubernetes and Pixie, instant Kubernetes observability with Pixie, distributed tracing, see all your traces without management headaches so you can find and fix issues fast, Network performance monitoring. Stop guessing where performance issues start and ditch data silos for a system-wide correlated view. And so much more. More importantly, you can pinpoint issues down to the line of code so you know exactly why the problem happened and you can resolve it quickly. That's why the dev and ops teams at DoorDash, GitHub, Epic Games, and more than 14,000 other companies use New Relic to debug and improve their software. Whether you run a cloud native startup or a Fortune 500 company, it takes five minutes to set up New Relic in your environment. That next 9 p.m. call is just waiting to happen. Get New Relic before it does, and you can get access to the whole New Relic platform and 100 gigabytes of data free per month forever. No credit card required. Sign up at newrelic.com slash floss. That's N-E-W-R-E-L-I-C dot com slash floss newrelic.com slash floss. So Hector, I was looking at, um, at, <laughs> at, cause I remembered, um, I, as you may know, I've, I've edited Linux journal for many years and it was a big deal when, when Linus revealed that he really liked using, um, a MacBook air or laptop, specifically the 11 inch one that was around for not very long, I don't think, but it was really tiny. And, uh, he liked the UI. And there are pieces now, he says he'd really love to have an M1 pack that ran Linux. It seems to be like you're, at the very least, aiming at a target audience of one, um, <laughs> but it's a very significant one who might be very highly leveraged. Uh, the, the the thing I'm wondering is, because I've I've been in two worlds for a long time. I, I was in a Mac, you know, I had the very first Mac sold in North Carolina in 1984. So, um uh, it was stolen rather quickly, <laughs> but, but anyway, um, <laughs> I'd love to have a dual boot, you know, I'd like to get one of those eight, you know, spend a zillion dollars and get one of the eight terabyte ones and, and partition it and run your thing on part of it and run Apple's thing in another part. Now, somebody at Apple told me that they got rid of Basecamp, it was, or something, you know, where, where you could partition as, uh, as part of their approach to things. So I'm wondering where that looks for you, if that's if that enlarges the marketplace at all. Um, that actually, that's actually like a a, a misconception. So they because um, boot camp started out as adding um, BIOS compatibility to EFI, which is pre UEFI Max um, back when that was a thing, right? And then Max started using UEFI, and then boot camp. Just at that point, just sort of became you know the the wizard that installs Windows. That's pretty much all it was. Mm. Um, and so on a modern Intel Mac, you can just like hold the right keys and plug in a UEFI bootable OS, and it'll just boot. You don't need you know Boot Camp. Um, so the thing when they say they got rid of Boot Camp on M1 Macs, they mean they won't run Windows because they're not PCs and they can't run UEFI. Uh, they will do a boot because Apple have their own entire you know boot system now for their ARM silicon machines and Apple silicon machines and it can run multiple installs of macOS and it can install Asahi Linux and it'll do a boot. In fact, we only support dual boot right now um, because you cannot upgrade um, system level firmware from Linux yet. And so we, you know, even though technically you can get rid of Mac OS if you really want to, we don't recommend people do that at this point because it's handy to have another OS to debug or reinstall or whatever. Um, so, 
yeah, if you run the installer today, it will partition your drive for you and install Linux. It will ask you how much space you want to allocate for each OS, and then you can use the native boot picker and uh, pick whatever US you want to boot. So and all that is supported. It's integrated into the Apple ecosystem. It's been there from day one, um, and we work with it. That's good news. <laughs> That's really good news. So uh, I'm wondering if there are any um, potential deal breakers. Um, uh, I know that Apple has sort of optimized their sound, at least on the laptops, for Dolby Atmos. And Dolby Atmos is a proprietary thing. It's not like stereo. Stereo is just like two speakers, two amplifiers, two speakers. It gives you a, a sound stage and is very well understood. Whereas Dolby Atmos, you know, once again, you're living inside um, somebody's proprietary something or other. It's probably not down at the hardware level, but I'm wondering if there are any things, any any submarine things in 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 the design of that chip that that when you start looking at it, which I just can't deal with that. Um, I don't think so. Uh, I can talk about audio, and that's problematic for a different reason. Um, but it ha I don't think it has, any, has anything to do with Atmos. Um, but uh, I haven't really seen anything that um, is impossible. I've think, seen things that are rather annoying, um, like because we basically there is Apple. You know, their stance in this whole thing is we make um, macOS for these machines. All of our you know firmware interfaces and everything we do um, is is for us, and so it you know you need to play by our rules, right? So they're not going to help us by having like stable APIs and things like that. Um, so there are some things that they did, which have been annoying for us to deal with. Um, but it's not like a deal breaker, right? It's just like, oh my God, they did what with the firmware ABI for the display controller. Um, and it's the kind of thing where if it were any other <laughs> vendor and they were writing the firmware and they were trying to upstream a Linux driver, the Linux kernel people would be like, what? the hell are you doing? Like, that's not going in. But because we don't get to do that, we don't get to fix Apple's firmware. Um, what are we going to do, right? We just make it work. And sorry, that, that's what it is, right? Um, so there's, you know, there are things that are like, from an engineering standpoint, less than ideal. <laughs> um, but there, I, there's no real like deal breakers that, um, that I know of. Um, as far as audio, what we've actually run into is just the... Um, you know, backward state of Linux audio on modern machines. Um, because, um, you know, all these laptops sound good when they run Windows and Mac OS because they have DSP. The speakers are crap. And then, you know, you put a big filter in front of them and you use some crazy EQ and crazy processing and suddenly they sound good. Well, guess what? Linux has no hardware, like not hardware DSP, but like no... Um, platform specific speaker calibration slash DSP framework. It's just not there, right? And so that's why you install Linux on like a Lenovo machine and the speakers sound like crap. Uh, it, because the, the, the Windows driver has, you know, a bunch of EQ in front. And of course, you of course you can plug in some, you know, whatever pulse effects or whatever thing in front manually, right? And um and manually fix your speakers. But that's not how it's supposed to be, right? You install Linux on it, and it should know, okay, this is this platform. I need to use this EQ profile and present these speakers as a stereo device. Um, the M1 Max uh, machines, have the laptops have six speakers, and you need a crossover in software to drive them. Linux doesn't have anything like that, right? Of course, you can pull it off with some random jack thing, and but like, there's no framework where we can define this like in a declarative way and say this platform needs this config, the users should see a stereo device and behind the scenes, it should do all the random magic to make the speaker sound good. It's not a thing on Linux. It's a thing on Android because they need it, <laughs> right? And they've implemented a framework for that. I think it's a thing on Chrome OS too, probably. Um, but it's just missing from the sort of, you know, Linux desktop ecosystem. And so that's something we need to go around and actually implement and talk to the Pipewire folks, folks and figure out how we're going to do this. Um, and so that's actually the block. That's why we don't have the speakers enabled in Asahi Linux right now. The driver works. Like we can send audio to the speakers, and if you do some crazy custom EQ, it works. Um, but uh, we want it to work for the users as you would expect, right? Where you just upgrade the package and you get a stereo device and all your apps do the right thing and you don't need to pre-configure pulse effects or something to make this sane, right? Um, and also, there's an issue where that these machines are almost impossible to destroy by screwing up your software, except I'm pretty sure the speakers. I'm pretty sure you can blow them if you set the volume too high or send them something crazy. 
So uh, un until we um, make sure we have kernel level volume caps and have like, you know, done some stress testing on how it's going to work with our EQ and everything to make sure that you can't blow your speakers, we're not going to enable them. Because <laughs> the last thing I want is to kill people's machines. <laughs> yeah, so that's not a good look for a project. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> It, it sounds like you need to uh, you need to hook up with Wim Tamens over at Pipeware, and you guys put your heads together and figure out what this framework needs to look like. Because yeah, I, but that I, sounds really useful for all kinds of different things. Yes, I mean, I've got yes. I've got a couple of JBL monitoring speakers behind me. It would be yes. great to be able to go into Pipeware and say, "Hey, these are my speakers. Automatically make them sound even better than they already do." Yes, uh, that would be great. Hey, we've got. A I, I do that with my the, headphones. Yeah, like I've got you know a, yeah. a little script that runs when jack starts and it sets up this routing and stuff it's like yeah i knew you can do it by hand right but like <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> yes hey so we've got a question that's coming from the chat room i want to make sure and cover this and this is parallels can you run a sahi on mac under parallels so many people ask that question that doesn't make any sense because Asahi is, you know, a port of Linux to the Apple Silicon hardware and Parallels on macOS does not virtualize Apple Silicon. It virtualizes a generic ARM machine. And so, so you can run you any can... Linux distro you want already. There you go. That's that's the answer. That's a great answer. <laughs> All right. So we've got to know Asahi. Are, is your project named after the Japanese super dry beer? No. <laughs> Really? <laughs> uh, but no. <laughs> Everyone thinks that. And it's like, okay, Asahi is a very generic Japanese word. There's like an Asahi ISP, an Asahi newspaper, the Asahi company that makes the super dry beer. Um, uh, but uh, it just means morning sun, by the way. But one of the things that is uh -huh. called Asahi in Japan is an apple variety. And specifically, it's the uh -huh. apple variety that in the US is known as the Macintosh. Which is what oh, gave the Mac wow. its name. And so that's why it's called Asahi. Very clever. I like it. Okay, wow. I've got to ask about the M1 because it is an ex it's an exciting chip. It does things that we've never really seen on ARM before. Does the M1, and I'm asking you to speculate here, I apologize for that. Does it have a life outside of these polished and complete Apple products? You know, you can go buy a, a Mac Mini and uh, a Mac Air with an M1 in it. Is there ever going to be a day when you can buy just an M1 or maybe a dev board with an M1 on it? Seems like that would be would be great for you guys, but you could give some some real competition to the the Raspberry Pi and all kinds of different things. I have no idea. I don't think Apple has plans for that right now. Um, but depending on you know how, where things go and who knows, Asahi Linux might be part of that. Um, they might change their minds as they do sometimes because they're Apple, right? Um, but I don't think Apple is planning anything like that at this point. Um, but who knows? You know, I have no idea what the future will bring. All right. Um, so you're you're kind of tied into the Linux kernel development. And there's I, I'm, I'm going to deviate just a little bit for a minute from the M1 stuff. And uh, just because I've got you here, I want to ask you about it. Um, there's something happen over in Linux land that is probably going to going to happen in about three weeks now. Reading the tea leaves. Uh, and that is Rust in the Linux kernel. And I'm curious, you know, as obviously somebody that's a, a kernel developer, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, have, you, have you thought about writing any of these drivers in Rust for Asahi? <laughs> um, well, I think, uh, like, you know, it's early. It's too early for us to start out with Rust on these drivers. Um, but uh, no, I actually think that's a very good idea um, because this, you know, this is something that, if you've been doing security, and I'm a security guy, um, if you've been doing security mm -hmm. for long enough, um, you know, people say, oh, you can write secure C code. No, you can't. <laughs> Nobody writes secure C code. Sorry. Like, I don't care how good you think you're writing at C code. You cannot write a secure C code. Nobody can. Um, and and you look at security vulnerabilities, and it's like, you know, 80% or something, memory corruption stuff that just would not happen if you were using Rust because it's just designed like that, right? And, um, and so, you know, Rust isn't like, uh, a perfect programming language by any means, but it does bring a lot to the table in that um, respect. And I think that makes a lot of sense for the kernel. Um, how long it will take before, um, you know, a significant chunk of Linux is written in Rust, I have no idea. Um, writing Rust is not um, trivial in the sense that, um, like I've, I've written some Rust before. We actually use Rust already in the Asahi Linux bootloader, um, mm. uh, partially. 
And we did that for security because we want to support secure boot mm -hmm. eventually. And there's like one specific part of the bootloader that needs to be uh, secure, um, particularly the FAT file system implementation and the signature verification. And that's like the attack surface, right? And so we make that in Rust um, so that it will be secure when we finally have the full secure boot stuff, uh, which isn't done yet. Um, but um, it's the same for Linux, right? Is that as you as you write chunks of it in Rust, you uh, you know remove whole chunks of it that are potentially vulnerable to these things. And so I'm excited about that. Um, I think it will take time though for you know big chunks of it to be written in Rust. Um, and you know until enough subsystems are mapped to Rust nightly, mm -hmm. it's not like we can just jump in and write you know all our drivers in Rust. <laughs> um, but uh, also. Um, and this is another thing, by the way. Uh, part of the reason that the um, that Asahi has gotten, you know, so far in this amount of time is that Apple actually makes really good hardware design-wise. Um, <laughs> having worked with other SOCs, this is a lot cleaner than most SOCs. And so, once you understand how the hardware works, um, the drivers are actually quite simple. Like you look at most of our drivers, and they are very short and very simple. Um, and there's very little nonsense in them, uh, especially at the hardware level. The like firmware defined APIs are a whole different kind of worms, but the actual like hardware, the silicon, is very very nice and easy to to drive. You know, once you understand it, which is why you know it's like we we haven't gotten stuck on like CPU frequency scaling, which on some other SOCs is like you know mountains of crazy clock configuration code. On these, it's like write one register, your CPU changes clock frequency, that's it. Um, so there's a lot of that on these machines, which means that there's definitely scope for both for proof of concept purposes and also for you know security purposes just rewriting a bunch of these drivers eventually in rust once it gets there in the kernel so i wouldn't be opposed mm -hmm. to that at all uh once you know once things get to that point probably a bit early for that um but yeah i'm excited about it yeah uh there there have been i'm sure you've seen this but there there have already been some calls from some fairly senior people in the kernel saying let's just go ahead and pull the the rust patches in for 519 and so that's, you know, it's about three weeks away. We isn't may see already, that. So that. Isn't it already in there? Because um, I think it's, I already got Rust support in like my kernels in the, in the configs. So I think it's already in there. They have uh, not pulled, like they've not pulled the tooling for Rust yet. Not into the, not into the vanilla Linux kernel. Uh, as of, as of last night. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, was that in patches. Linux? Oh, was was that in Linux Next? Oh yeah, because I was basing my thing on Linux Next until now, and it was in Linux Next then. So it was pulled into is, Linux Next, but not uh, but not upstream then, because I I I rebased on an RC like just last week, and and I just realized it's not there now. But it was when I was running on Linux Next. Okay, so that explains it. Yeah. It's it's coming very soon. Things are happening. Yep. yep. <laughs> uh, we probably should so actually get the, the, the kernel the kernel that is currently shipping to the uh, Saki Linux users is the tree that has Rust in it, though I don't think it's enabled. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. I'm actually like downgrading that to RC now with the next version because we were running on very bleeding edge at that point. Yeah, fun. Okay, so if somebody wants to try Asahi on their Mac machines, what does that look like? Do you guys, uh, is there an ISO for live boot? Can someone try it out without doing an install? Uh, no, you have to install it. So that's actually part of the uh, security. So this this is another thing, right? The, like booting alternate OSs on these machines is quite a bit different from what you're used to. Uh, and it all comes down to how Apple designed their secure boot. Um, and I actually have a whole document where I explain how this works on our on our wiki if you want to get into the details. But basically, don't expect it to work um, with like USB boot uh, and things like that. And there are like valid security reasons for that, right? It's not Apple mm -hmm. being difficult because they want to be difficult. <laughs> um, but um, having looked at their design, like a lot of it makes sense. So basically, mm -hmm. the... Um, you know, the the low level, the what you need to do if you want to run your own OS on these things involves booting into recovery mode and typing some commands in, in the shell there. Um, what we do is we've automated almost all of this with a bunch of magic and uh, and Python and, and things. So the way end users actually install Asahi Linux now is you go, you, you, put, you, you have to um, be running Mac OS. So you do have to, like if you have a new machine, you have to at least create your you know, Mac OS user and go through first time setup. Uh, and then you open up a terminal and you run a command that we have on our website that is curl um, HTTPS ALX.SH pipe SH. And uh, that will get you into an installer, which is a, right now a text mode um, you know, sort of wizard. Um, but it, it's very nice. It's got colors and stuff. And it just prompts you, just guides you through everything. 
um, and it will prompt you to resize your Mac OS partition um, and then to pick an install image to install. And you can install a pre-configured image or you can just install a UEFI boot environment, at which point you could boot from USB. Um, and then once that's done, you reboot and it um, you have to reboot holding down the power button. That's part of the security thing. That's how you uh, like assert physical presence it's so that you can't um, like hijack your OS you know, through malware or something like that. So you hold down the power button and then it um, actually kicks you into the um, uh, terminal again in recovery mode. Once you do that, we have a little cheat for that. Um, and you have to type in your credentials a couple of times, then it's done. It reboots and you get the, the screen that actually you just saw, which is the actual first time wizard that we have for us at Linux, which is just, um, that's actually creating your users and stuff. So that's when the OS is already installed. So the whole thing only takes a few minutes. It installs over the network. Um, it, it streams everything from the internet. Um, it is technically possible to do like a USB based install on these machines. But the main thing is that we can't redistribute like a self contained image you put on USB and install. And the reason for that is that installing requires us to copy Apple firmware, uh, including some boot components and some firmware components. Um, because basically like the boundary of what is an OS on these machines is not the boundary of what we are allowed to change. So we basically, this is part of how we avoid having uh, firmware compatibility issues. Um, when you install Asahi, it's going to install itself pretending to be a particular version of macOS with that particular version of macOS as firmware. And that means that even if you then upgrade macOS and it upgrades like your core firmware that's backwards compatible, it upgrades its own firmware that doesn't affect anything else. So you're not going to have any problems with upgrading macOS and that breaking Asahi or anything like that. Um, but in exchange for that, and because of the design of these machines, that means that we do need to get Apple stuff that we can't redistribute. Um, and the installer does that by downloading it from their CDN because it is just available at an HTTPS URL from you know their their server. So there's no weirdness, there's no authentication, there's no you know sign up or anything. All that's automated, but it just means we can't just give you an ISO to put it on a USB disk. So what we're going to do eventually, what I want to do eventually anyway, is have the installer have an option to make a USB installer for you. Um, where it will download and put everything it needs on the USB drive. And then if you plug it into another machine, you could do an offline install. Um, but that's not done yet. Wow. So I, I have, what I, I risk being a dumb question, but maybe not. I mean, a thousand years ago, um, I'm, I'm, wonder, I'm wondering if any of the stuff that was done a thousand years ago, I'm thinking specifically of Yellow Dog Linux, um, which is a, an early attempt to, probably the main attempt to, uh, get Linux onto Mac uh, Mac hardware, um, but also Apple's own work with Darwin. That was they, when they decided they were going to go open source. Darwin was a big thing. At Linux Journal, we actually thought of starting a Darwin publication uh, way back when. Is any of that uh, is any of that relevant at this stage at all? Uh, XNU and Darwin are open source, um, and in fact, you can compile your own macOS kernel and uh, you know build your image and install it, and it will boot macOS to a desktop. And there's a few things that don't work. But most of it does. Um, but um, I think it's not relevant in the sense that something people would actually want to use. Um, it's open source sort of, you know, because app, because the license required Apple to keep it open source. And and so they have a bunch of things they dump source for. But um, I don't think anyone expects, uh, you know, to run non-Mac OS systems on Macs, especially because um, it's increasingly getting more and more, um, you know, integrated with how Apple wants to do things on their OS. So they really, really don't care about, you know, like any third party, um, tr you know, trying to run their own distribution, so to speak, on top of that kernel. And you need all of Apple's proprietary drivers anyway, and some of those are going to need, you know, proprietary user space tooling, and then that's going to require a, a pile of, you know, dependencies, and it's just not viable. Like, for example, I don't think you can get Wi-Fi working on a Mac without, like, Mac OS. Uh, I mean, you know, on Darwin, uh, unless you remake a whole bunch of scaffolding, which is not open source. Um, so yeah, like, I don't think it's really relevant. Um, and for us, it's also not terribly useful because most of that code is not something that, um, that we're interested in because it's mostly the core kernel, but some things are. So I do have, you know, a dump of it, uh, that I grip around every once in a while if I'm looking for something interesting. Uh, for example, it does tell us things about how the CPUs go to sleep, which will be useful when we, um, implement power management for that. Um, but only that you know, sort of super low level stuff. It doesn't tell you anything about drivers because all of those are closed source. 
So yeah, I think that's mostly dead as a as a like viable open source ecosystem. Um, but it is still at least the core is still being open sourced. So I know Jonathan is is queued up with a uh, at least a question about a a one release. But before we let you answer that one, I have to let everybody know that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Collide. That's Collide with a K. Collide is a new take on endpoint management that asks the question, how can we get end users more involved? This is in contrast to old school device management tools like MDM, which lock down your employees' devices without considering their needs or even attempting to educate them about the security of their laptop. Collide is built by like-minded security practitioners who in the past saw just how much MDM was disrupting their end users, often frustrating them so bad that they would throw up their hands and just switch to using their personal laptops without telling anybody. In that scenario, everybody loses. Collide, on the other hand, is different. Instead of locking down a device, Collide takes a user-focused approach that communicates security recommendations to your employees directly on Slack. After Collide is set up, device security turns from a black and white state into a dynamic conversation This conversation starts with the end users installing the endpoint agent on their own through a guided process that happens right inside their first Slack message. From there, Collide regularly sends employees recommendations when their device is in an insecure state. This can range from simple problems like the screen lock not being set correctly to hard to solve or nuanced issues like asking people to secure two-factor backup codes sitting in their downloads folder properly. And because it's talking directly to employees, Collide is educating them about the company's policies and how to best keep their devices secure using real tangible examples, not theoretical scenarios. Collide, cross-platform endpoint management for Linux, Mac, and Windows devices that puts end users first, for teams that Slack get endpoint management that puts the user first, visit collide.com slash floss to learn more and activate a free 14-day trial today. No credit card required. Visit kolide.com slash floss today. And right now you can get a goodie bag of Collide swag after signing up for a new trial as their way of saying thank you. So Jonathan, you want to ask that question? <laughs> yes. So I, I see in your documentation that I'm not supposed to ask this, but I'm going to anyway. When will Asahi Linux be done? And really what we want to know is when are you planning a, a 1.0 release? Can you see that far into the future? I mean, we don't have version numbers, right? Like I, I, when we released the alpha uh, a couple <laughs> months ago, you know, I, I called it alpha so that people didn't get any expectations of like, you know, everything magically working perfectly. It does not represent where we want to be. Um, but, um, I, you know, I, it would have to be specific milestones, right. That we talk about. And the thing is, um, there's no plan, right. There's no like master plan because this is a community project and it just depends on what people are working on. And like as the lead and as, you know, the guy with the the most visible Patreon page, my job is to do everything nobody else Mm -hmm. is doing, right? So if someone new comes in and says, I want to do this, then that's going to happen, right? So for example, um, I had Bluetooth on my back burner because, uh, you know, I'll get to it someday. And uh, I thought a lot lot more things were going to be more important. And then... um, R just uh, showed up uh, on an IRC, uh, I think it was a few weeks ago or something, and uh, they started uh, looking at uh, at a bunch of things, including the video decoders and then Bluetooth. And suddenly there is a Bluetooth uh, prototype driver that is not useful in production, but like proves that the interface is now understood. And so suddenly Bluetooth is now a lot further up my stack because... Uh, if they worked out, you know, how the hardware works, I can, I can write a driver for that. Sure. Right. So there, you know, the plan changes every time someone decides to do something different and, and therefore I can't say, right. Um, what's going to happen first, what's going to happen next. Um, but, uh, I think it's, um, if, if, if you force me to, you know, finger in the wind, make educated guesses about (laughs) things, um, I would say we're definitely going to have an accelerated desktop this year. Um, that's not going to take that long. And, um, you know, audio is just polishing things. Um, sleep mode is actually, and, and power management is actually mostly blocked on uh, on politics types things with the kernel on doing it right. Because we all, uh, our big thing is doing everything right. You know, we don't hack around and, 
and 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 make it work first and then figure out how to upstream it we are writing everything to be upstreamable from day one as much as we can and that necessarily involves shaving the axe and bike shedding and 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 you know talking to other people and figuring out what the right way of doing things is um so that does mean that some things take long but they get upstreamed faster right and uh so you know things are moving uh, pretty well, and I think it's not uh, going to take that long. Also, um, there's one thing I want to point out. If you give me a second, um, because I know I mentioned UEFI boot, um, I want to say that this isn't only about Linux uh, because we are working with the OpenBSD guys too. Um, we we have uh, a boot stack, and it's UEFI boot. And in fact, our UEFI boot option right now is intended to boot you know distros that support us, uh, you know these machines, which none do right now. But OpenBSD does, and they just got a release that you can actually install today um, using our installer in UEFI mode. Um, so uh, yeah, just just you know wanted to to point out that this is not just about Linux. Uh, we have uh, other folks working on things too, and we are open to working with uh, any other OSs that uh, might be interested. So we're getting down toward the end of the hour here, and I want to ask a, a at least one uh, question. You mentioned Patreon earlier, and I'm wondering. Yep. A couple of things. One is, um, uh, do you have a, I, I'm kind of thinking you don't have a business model for this and maybe don't want one. Um, but whether or not you do, do you have a day job? And also, where are you? <laughs> and, <laughs> I'm and in Japan. I have a I'm music question because the yeah. keyboards are hard to ignore there. And uh, <laughs> it looks interesting. Yeah, no, um, I, uh, I've been uh, freelancing in Tokyo for a while now. And when I started this project, um, Having worked on these sort of you know Linux ports to weirdo machines before, um, you know I I've done throwaway ports. I've done ports that were sort of okay, but you know I knew that making this into something actually usable for users, into something that actually ends up in you know support for these machines with everything done properly, it's not something you can do in your spare time. It just isn't, and so that's why I had this idea of doing it as a Patreon because I need this to be, if not my full time job at least a significant part of my time. Um, and so and so that's why I, I, I chose this route, and I'm very grateful that people actually uh, signed up and are letting me do that. So um, these days, most of my income is actually that Patreon. I still do some other gigs. Um, I have some other stuff that I do uh, with a company here in Tokyo and, and such. Um, but it's very liberating you know being able to focus on this and not it just being a well, i got back from work and i have to sit down to work on this or i'm too tired or i do it on weekends and then i have no life because it's work and you know that open source project and, and that kind of thing right um ha having an income source like that really makes it possible to have this be something that is sustainable that i can keep doing over the years it's been over a year now right and that wouldn't be unthinkable with prior projects that I've done because it's, it was always, you know, like a month of crunch time of having, you know, no spare time and then you get burned out and then, and then, and then it, 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 you forget about it. And, and it's different this time. I said, that sounds like you've got almost an ideal life going on there. I don't know if you answered the music <laughs> question or not. I mean, what kind of, do you play those keyboards? It looks like it looks serious. Yeah. Yeah. So. I, I play them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that is a hobby. And, that, and that's the thing too, right? Is is because I'm doing it as, you know, as a job, I can have hobbies other than programming. And I find that very important, right? It's like my entire life, if my entire life is programming, you, you get tired of things after a while, right? And so, yes. um, no, I, I am in uh, in like uh, a couple amateur bands here in Tokyo and I go to like jam sessions and things like that. And I have a little side uh, side hobby making music. Um, I was actually just uh, selling at an event here in Tokyo just last weekend. Um, so I, I'm not like, you know, very proficient, but I try to release a few songs every year or something like that. So it, it's a hobby of mine. <laughs> Fantastic. So um, I, if, if, I'd love to put some of those in the show notes if you, if we could. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I can I, I can give you the link. Yeah, there's a YouTube channel yeah. with like everything on it and a band camp and, and stuff. It's all in Japanese, by the way. <laughs> like it's Japanese songs. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. Us, we have, we have, we have listeners fine. everywhere and with many, every language. So, um, we have to, we're down at the closing time. So, f f we generally end uh, end with just a, a couple of questions. Well, the first is, if you could answer briefly, is there anything we haven't asked that you would like to answer uh, before we get out? Uh, I don't know. I think I covered most of it. Um, You've covered a lot. Yeah, <laughs> I think you hit most of everything. Yeah, there's a lot to talk about, but I think you hit pretty much all the points that I wanted to talk about. 
Yeah, this is a, a very rich show. So the uh, the 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 final two just are: um, what are your favorite text editor and scripting language? <laughs> we ask everybody that. Uh, yeah, I, I mentioned Python. Um, it is Python uh, for scripting. Mm-hmm. Um, like my two main languages are Python and C, and I just find them to be, you know, sort of the the, the opposites that that makes the most sense for me. Um, <laughs> but uh, as far as text editors, everyone who watches my streams and I do stream a lot of my Asahi Linux work on YouTube uh, knows that I use Kate. Um, I also use Vim, uh, but uh, most of the time I'm programming in Kate. And you're streaming your programming. That's cool. <laughs> 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 Everything. I, I don't know. Somebody told me this morning, you know, radio and television are dead because, um, oh, and the iPad, uh, I'm not the iPad, the iPod and everything pod. Oh, yeah. That of the old school, the music itself is now a whole different mode. You know, it's, it's off radio. It's off of you own it and record it. It's just a whole other place. still sell CDs here. I was selling CDs last weekend. <laughs> really? That, well, that's yeah, the thing. Yeah, in Japan, I, I never, CDs are still alive. Yeah. I, I don't do, I don't go to any concerts I, I, that somebody's not the selling the album parts that I that, print out. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so, yeah. And like I burned them here and I have a printer that died last weekend too. Like, yeah, like, it printers. <laughs> anyway. Well, this has been great. It has been it's awesome having great. you on the show. And uh, and we say this to almost everybody, but we have to have you back because I, I one of the things that strikes me about this is that the market is huge. I mean, it used to be Apple was kind of a side market and it's not yeah. anymore. It's a trillion dollar yeah. company and it's a... I mean, their the, the revenue is bigger than Toyota. I mean, it's like gigantic and and it's all going out in these M1 chips, right? So there's just a lot out there. You know, the, Intel used to be that and now ARM is that. And with yeah. Apple's hunk of it getting bigger and bigger. So it's a big deal you're dealing with there. <laughs> I'm I'm glad I'm very glad that like this is something that people are actually using um and that it's and more people will hopefully as 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 it improves right because um it's very different sort of you know doing like a, a a toy port of Linux to some platform or you know something that requires hacks to make it work and then you end up with like a tiny you know subset of people working on it and 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 this is not that right like this this is something that you know I I want to use in fact I'm very much looking forward to making this my main machine once the GPU is up because they're just that good. Yeah. They're just, they're good machines, right? They make you want to well, use them, and I just don't want to use macOS, so I want to use Linux. <laughs> right? Yeah, well, it's it, it used to be that everybody had old old Intel iron laying around, and there's going to be a lot of old yeah. Apple iron laying around, and yeah. that's that's significant stuff. Well, we've gone over time, so thanks so much again for being on the show. Yeah, thank you. It was a pleasure. Likewise. So, Jonathan, we're. <laughs> <laughs> take a breath. Take a breath, <laughs> take a uh, breath exactly. Fun. I know yes. that was huge. Yeah, that it was, was huge. Fun. Um, it's, I, I, yes, it's fascinating. You know, so I, I was just thinking about this. Um, he, he made the case that right now it makes sense to buy an M1 machine and some of them are, are really worth it for the price. But I was thinking just the other day I was in, a, I was at a pawn shop and somebody walked in with a couple of generations old, uh, you know, Apple laptop. And uh, I don't think the guy in the pawn shop wouldn't give him 200 bucks for it. And it's like, well, if, if suddenly you have a, an ecosystem where, you know, a couple of years old laptop, you could get it that cheaply. And then it's running something as good as the M1 and you can put a really good Linux distro on it. You're right. This this idea of, of being able to breathe new life into these secondhand machines, it really makes sense. And so I'm, I can't believe I'm going to say this. I'm excited about the idea of maybe eventually owning and using some Mac hardware. And I need to go wash my mouth <laughs> out with soap after saying that. But <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to dirty my mouth by telling you that I'm talking to you over a f- more than five-year-old, originally top-of-the-line, two-terabyte um, uh, Intel-based Mac right now. And and I'm thinking of its second life. And... Um, and and Apple told me the other day. I was just looking it up. I mean, I just looked it up. It's worth three hundred dollars, right? You know, right. Not, you know, that's what Apple would give me for it. You know, on a trade in, which I'm not going to do. But that tells you something. I think you're right about that. Is is a is a frontier opening up out there? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, we've got we've gotten to the point to where old hardware is still pretty usable in a lot of cases, and. Uh, that's just, that's an interesting thing. You know, it used to be that, you know, you had a computer that was a year and a half old or two years old and well, it just wasn't useful for anything anymore. But 
You know, I mean, you, there's there's some ten year old hardware out there now that's you could throw a Linux distro on and do a lot of things mm-hmm. with. And uh, I think we're we're marching more and more down that direction. So it's it's just interesting to see. Yeah, and it's like I mean, we have we have old cars. You know, we have used cars everywhere. These are the vehicles we drive now, right? I mean, these mm-hmm. things. So why not have a you know a robust used market in that stuff? A lot of a lot of possibilities there. So yeah, we we could riff on that for a again. while, but we got to yeah. go. <laughs> we got to get out of here. <laughs> um, so 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 your your plugs, man. We got oh got yes. Some. All right. So uh, the the main thing that I'll mention, well, I have two things. So first off, Hackaday. Uh, I run the security column over there. It goes live every Friday and then I uh, cover some other things, usually Linux news, but other things. Uh, I'm working on coverage on the Rust news that, like I say, I think it's going to land here in mainline Linux in about three weeks. And that'll be interesting. Um, and then the other thing is the Untitled Linux Show. And if you're not a part of Club Twit, you really need to get over there. Get on Club Twit and go subscribe to the Untitled Linux Show. Get the RSS feed. Uh, catch us live if you want to. You can be part of the conversation, but you really need to get over there and get plugged into it because if you want up-to-date, bleeding-edge Linux news, command line tips, all kinds of great stuff, that is where it's at. So much stuff going on. I actually spent this weekend listening live to, <laughs> to to stuff on Twitter more than usual. There's so much going on. So, But we have to move on to the next thing. Uh, thanks so much. Um, next week, and I haven't lined up next week yet. That is what I always do. I always like forget to really look at the schedule. So I'm looking at it now. Mason Walker. Okay. Um, but Jason walks out. <laughs> the voice in my head is telling me. It's, Okay, it says James Walker, but anyway, um, and uh, uh, it, anyway, it, it, he's coming up. I'm, forgive me, folks. I don't have the whole. I don't have the whole thing down there, but it's always a good show. So come back next week, and until then, I'm Doc Searles. This is Floss Weekly. See you then. Did you spend a lot of money on your brand new smartphone, and then you look at the pictures on Facebook and Instagram, and you're like? What in the world happened to that photo? Yes, you have. I know it happens to all of us. Well, you need to check out my show, Hands on Photography, where I'm going to walk you through simple tips and tricks that are going to help make you get the most out of your smartphone camera or your DSLR or mirrorless, whatever you have. And those shots are going to look so much better. I promise you. So make sure you're tuning in to twit.tv hop for hands on photography to find out more.